We are in uh, Brighton with uh, Lukman Onikosi, who is uh, a Nigerian, uh, has come here as a Nigerian uh, student when he fell ill with uh, Hep B. And uh, now uh, you risk to be deported back to Nigeria where there are no facilities, you said, no facilities uh, to treat your uh, sickness. Uh, yes, um, the, the facilities in Nigeria is quite... Um, the, uh, the adequate treatment I need to, to stay alive is, is not available in Nigeria. And the, it's not really the treatment that matters. It is the monitoring itself that really matters because uh, liver disease is a very complicated and the least researched organ in the body. And uh, for in the case of UK, for instance, uh, even though the facility needed in the UK I, 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 that I need to stay alive, the respite to stay alive here in the UK, there is still no one definitive way of seeing how, uh, how quickly or how slowly my liver is deteriorating. So basically I have to do uh, about five or six different kind of tests every six months, like from liver biopsy to ultrasound scan to MRI scan, you name it. You know, all sorts of scan compared to other organs in the body where you can just, for instance, for the brain, you can easily do MRI scan and you can tell how the brain is functioning. But with the liver, it is very, very complicated, you know, and to, to be able to even understand what is happening to my liver, all this has to be done for, and then each of these um, results will be compared and, you know, side to side to see a bigger map of the of the liver function, uh, functionab uh, functionality. But uh, maybe this is a problem of uh, money because uh, there are these facilities in Nigeria, uh, but they are more expensive. It's, it's not, <laughs> I need to say this, well, before I came to the UK, I was very much political. Um, I was um, a, a University of Adoikiti in, uh, in, in Western Nigeria. Um, I was an educational rights campaign. Basically, it was about the period when uh, Nigeria just moved from military to democratic government. And then at that point in time, Nigerian government was massively um, privatizing and commercializing every public sector. And uh, me particularly, I was very much interested in the, in the two basic things, which is education and the health service. And that itself, it becomes the irony of where I am today. This is one of the reasons I could not go back home because, uh, because uh, Nigerian government is not adequately funding health service. Um, there's, there, there is lots of documentation, on, even on the internet, about the rate of people dying with hepatitis, hepatitis in Nigeria. Um, in the world, there is about 48 million people with HIV and AIDS. For, if you put <laughs> compare it to hepatitis, which it has about 400 million, right, and about 20 million people die almost every year. You know, in Nigeria, the average of the people that, that, that have hepatitis does not even know they have hepatitis. And I, I've been following the news in Nigeria where there is a serious campaign for the Nigerian government to, to, to develop the health system, particularly to help people with hepatitis. I've got two siblings that die from it. So that's a manifestation that there is no available support treatment they needed. Even though they can get screened, people can get screened, even though it, that is expensive on its own, but at the same time, you get screened and you know you are dying of, uh, you have a liver disease. But the, the scarring that is occurring in your liver, the multiplication of the of the virus in your liver, the the flexibility uh, flexi uh, flexibility uh, of 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 the liver itself has to be mentioned. The coloration and all sort of uh, things that you have to the fat as well, the way you, at rate at which your liver can store nutrients and release nutrients to your body where or your organs of your body when you need them, the antibodies you need to even be able to fight germs. All these things has to be measured. Because they all come from the liver, and uh, that's the that's the extent of how complicated the and uh, uh, essential the work of the liver on the body. And if people in Nigeria could not even get the kind of treatment they need, no, no, sorry, monitoring they need to be able to see how their liver is deteriorating, it's like a death sentence where you are already been told you're gonna die, but there's nothing for you to do to stop you from dying. 
you know this is this is scary and this is very harrowing uh, for for people i'm i'm not just saying this because i'm here in the west to say it i'm actually using this this to raise awareness about what is going on in nigeria i have a group called hepatitis bay foundation which uh, at the moment is just a facebook campaign where i talks about L, uh, hepatitis issue around the world and the kind of um um, research that is going on around the world to do that. I'm part of a group here in the UK who is trying to find, uh, uh, they call it motor scan uh, research. They're trying to look for one definitive way of measuring the deterioration of the liver. And these are all the effort I am trying to call attention to. At the same time, uh, hepatitis in the world, like I said, there's like 400 million people. That's like eight times the number of people with HIV and AIDS. What really scares me most is that HIV and AIDS has got so much support, so much financial funding and to, to for research, but hepatitis, hepatitis has nothing. And when you even look at the way which uh, uh, HIV and AIDS was able to get its attention, I think it's because, mostly because in the 80s when the celebrities, particularly in America, were suffering from, suddenly developed this mysterious illness hiv and aids uh, aids suddenly there was a sudden interest from the uh, uh pharmaceutical uh biological industrial complex in terms of trying to make money from that and they were able to find a market for it which is africa you know where say, the majority of people with the hiv but actually you know and i think that is what is actually driving why appetite i mean sorry hiv and AIDS have so much support but you can count or you cannot even you i can't think i, I can't think of any um celebrity who has died of um chronic hepatitis or maybe they did not say it's not uh, made public <laughs> probably yes probably uh there are people with a liver condition but then what causes the liver condition probably they 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 have um autoimmune whether it is hepatitis C or hepatitis B, and again, there's a stigma and stereotype with people with uh, with hepatitis C, particularly the the idea that you people who get it is is through uh, drug taking, uh, using a needle to, to do a drug play, and that that is very very. Uh, I think that is rude and unfair to people like my brother who uh, is. I, I think he died virgin because I never. I he, he was trying to get married, and he, the last Facebook chat I had with him was that. He is suffering because he's not just suffering because of the health, but his social relationship. Because when he make it clear to to this uh, to to the his status, his the status to 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 his sexual or somebody who wants to get involved that like he wants to get. He's very religious, you know, and he told me that most of them turn him down because of that, you know. And and this is the huge stigma that that goes with it. And I, I was going. To, I'm writing an article for Guardian newspaper at the moment, and I was going through the Facebook chat I had with my brother before he died. I didn't realize how much pain he was going through. Even talking about it now is making me very angry and upset because I felt like the, the Nigerian government failed him. He is, he is the genius in the family. Like, I, 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 everything I've become today was because of him. Everything, the way I was able to, to, to strive you know that kind of the uh, uh, attitude you have, or your relationship with your with your immediate siblings, particularly the one next to you, or you know whether it's the senior one or the younger one. You know that competition. It's not. It's not hate. It's like kind of this. Um, the 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 way you're trying to like pose yourself that I can do better. And the Africa, where I come from, the senior person is this. It must be the strong horse in the front. You know. And I was not as genius as him. I was, in the class. I was like number twenty something. He was like number one to three. You know, and I, I had to basically look for a way where I, I can do better than he does that they cannot really challenge me on that. And that was politics, you know. And because of that, at one point when my father died, you know, I lived six years of my life with him in a boarding house in, uh, in, in, in Quara State, in uh, Government Secondary School in Ilorin. Uh, we, 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 and we live in the village, so we, to go into a city, to live in the city together, it becomes my body, you know, it becomes you don't have your parent, you're responsible for each other. So he was like, he's, he's the closest person to me because he was my nest of kin in, in the whole of the family. I cannot really, I cannot really emphasize that. But what, what, what really makes me very hungry is that a genius like him who is already understanding how industrialization can happen in Nigeria where we have to look to the way which we actually 
the, the key two important things that Eve told me, which he got from his own lecturer, which is Nigeria has oil, which is the one that basically uh, allows you to generate any kind of energy. And then the iron itself, which can be used to build any kind of uh, uh, machine. And if you have these two, you can actually build an industry. You can be, that is the core backbone of industrialization and these are the things we understood and we wanted to work on and nigerian government could not even save his life when 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 it was when it was very ill and that makes me hungry what's your uh, current status about immigration uh, i think you are targeted uh, by many many people yes uh, if you look at the article that uh dr alana linton uh, who was my former uh lecturer at the University of Sussex. Now she's she's a lecturer in Australia. She wrote the article she wrote about me. She has written twice. The the last one and the, uh, the first one and the second one were basically the public outpour uh, was basically very disgusting and very sad that like people could actually excuse me say horrible things like that. But I, I need to make this clear that the non EU international student market in the UK what's about 40 billion to the uk economy right and this is this does not even include the trickle down economics say for instance paying your a student paying their house rent going to uh to buying sh uh, food in the grocery shops to buying clothes to going to restaurants um and when their friends and family visit them those money they spend in the community local immediate local community where they're living you know that itself is not even be it's not even added to the 40 billion and for people to say that i am i'm milking the system and because of that i i did not merit uh uh the the kind of um support and then the nhs is not an international nhs a national nhs that's ridiculous because first they they not the migrants like I said, uh, non-EU international students are the biggest contributor to the to the UK economy. Two, uh, every migrant are not just sitting on their bum to basically expect the government to to give them money. They are hardworking people. They even some most of them keep their head down. They don't even get involved with politics. What and you were forced to stop uh, university? I, I, before I was even uh, stopped to uh, to stop university, I paid all my school fees. I paid international student fee. When I finished studying, I was working with the Nigerian government. I was earning up to 20000 a year. And all those times I was paying my taxes as well. On top of that, I came back to the university my, uh, for my MA. I paid about £13,000, which was crowdfunded in many ways, in different ways. The people of the public actually contributed money to pay for my master's. Now I cannot even get my certificate. Where is the ghost, uh, if, if, which uh, uh, I don't really agree with capitalism, but then where is my home customer service right? Because education has been so commercialized that uh, all these uh, things that, that goes with the, the right of customers has not even been recognized any longer. What do you ask now to the UK government, to the politics, also to the opposition? Um, I think, <laughs> see, what is happening to me is a legacy of colonial uh, colonialism that has happened even though some people say oh uh, colonialism has been di di dismantled in, in the uh, immediately after second world war no colonialism still goes on in fact colonialism the historical colonialism has been replaced with coloniality which is the power dynamics you know we have this thing called commonwealth right we the the, the wealth that i was actually uh, uh, that we generate in africa Compared to the kind of foreign direct investment that goes into Africa, what leaves Africa is huge, you know, and that is the reason why the Nigerian government could not even fund its own public sectors, you know, particularly health and education, you know, and it is only natural. And then the idea that we, uh, when, 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 you, when, when the British government wants to justify uh, Commonwealth, they use the idea of globalization. That we live in a globalized world that we need to do things uh, to how it affects ourselves but when the effect of globalization is catching up in terms of migration right it becomes no 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 we have to close our border to all these states you, you see p british people need to understand that uh, 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 a life on the streets of brighton yeah random life in a household in the street of brighton is directly correlated that, that it has a direct uh, uh, relation 
with somebody in the in the corner of uh, an African village, uh, in the middle of nowhere in a community, you know, and that that is globalization. So whatever your the so called standard of living that you have to have a mortgage, you have to pay your rent and everything, is directly is directly linked to how the the other person in the other region of the world is being dispossessed. Take for instance uh, uh, Congo. Right, we need a mobile phone. We need uh, very good equipment in the NHS. We need uh, uh, fancy television. It needs fancy phone and things like that. Where does the resources come from? Where does the, the, the tantalum comes from? The coltan. Huh? The coltan. The coltan. Yes, it comes from Congo. And what is happening in Congo now? What has been going on since 1885 in Congo? Right. And then the people in Congo, the young people in Congo, could not even go. To, they had to choose between either joining the warlord in order to protect their family, or go to school and get killed. And when these when the young people flee that air region to, to, the, to the west for, for, for uh, sanctuary, you, you then uh, subject them to a humiliating process of trying to justify if they were telling the truth or they were lying. That, 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 that is the itself is coloniality because you, because of the way you have to live your life, because of the way they say uh, the things you need to justify uh, development has to come from these countries and these countries themselves is not actually benefiting them nigeria is very rich in terms of uh, oil of natural resources uh, and but uh, people are still uh, poor why why this uh, injustice why cannot this oil be used uh, to uh, support the growth of the country see it i think people want a, a very quick answer and just basically want to look at the present time 2016 right there is no you there, there is no like sankofa in, in Ghanaian uh, uh, culture you cannot talk about the future without not looking at what is happening at, what happened at the back you know but what i want to say is that uh when nigeria uh, it's a little bit of history but very quickly in order not to take people's time uh what i want to say is that when nigeria got independence like other african countries the west where uh who has been profiting from colonialism from 1885 to we've not even had a slavery right from 1885 to 1960 when nigeria got independence all those periods the resources that was taken from nigeria when were, were not even were, were taken away to the west to better the west you know but then what, what then happened, what was very significant was that when, when Nigeria got independence, there was no, uh, no kind of reparation for the country to build its own institution. So, for instance, if you're an apprentice, right, if you finish your, your training, your boss gives you some kind of um, support, whether it's financial support or tools for you to, t to start your business. So, you look at colonialism, which is weird in a, in a kind of apprenticeship way. When we got independence that we need to build our own institution, particularly the public sector institution, there was no money. So Nigerians had to borrow the money. But then what, what becomes very interesting about when Nigerians struck oil, right? Nigeria has borrowed so much money to build the institutions to run first. And while building the institution, Nigeria was put under the condition by the US and IMF and World Bank that Nigeria, uh, Africa, the developing countries has to assure the west that they can pay back their import from the west so in a way to do that you have to keep part of your gdp in foreign currency it's called foreign reserve or international reserve so all the wealth that nigerians generating from uh, from oil right they at that point in time nigeria was able to build a refinery so all the byproducts that come from oil was able to go into different kind of uh different kind of sector from from uh, petroleum jelly to to vaseline to diesel to uh, engine oil to making plastic uh, petrochemical but refineries are not working at the, and in the 60s it, they were working right and they were building they were generating the 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 capacity at the capacity rate they were going to do that then th things happen in a very very weird way the corruption that kicks in the military corruption that kicks in so the the kind of um turnaround maintenance that is needed to be able to carry on the work which that thing was was basically uh, uh ruin the facilities on top of that nigeria still carry on pumping oil and will keep pumping it overseas but what is what I'm trying to say to you is that it's not just the corruption that matters, and corruption itself did not just happen out of the blue. It was successive uh, repression, or how do you say it, favoritism that happened when the British uh, were there, when the when the Yorubas and the Yibos thought they would be favored, and they give the power to the to the Aousas, 
right? And then everything teams then become a tribal thing, you know? And then as, as, as the result of, result of favoritism that happened then becomes nepotism when people start like saying, oh, I'll bring my family into the government. You know, all that, all that was a legacy of colonialism. But what I want to say to you in terms of oil is that all the surpluses that we generated, say for instance, uh, uh, when Iraqi war happened, right? You don't have to look at the whole history of Nigeria from one similar, uh, one uniform explanation. Every stages of Nigeria has a different analysis. So, particularly the one in the, after the immediate of 1991, Nigeria moved to democratic government. Iraqi war happens, right? The oil price jumped up. Demand for oil, oil jumped up as well because Iraqi production was shut off. Nigeria, the demand falls on Nigeria, you know, and Nigeria was basically from 2.6 billion reserve in the international reserve jumped to about 60 billion. And Nigeria then have additional, uh, they call it excess crude oil account, w you know. So because of that windfall in price, Nigeria generated so much money. And the, what makes me very angry most is that that money was not kept in Nigeria. Where did uh, this money go? <laughs> uh, it's a very straightforward answer, you know, because when you look at the way which the way the money is set up to to be to be saved, and uh, it, it is basically saved with the IMF and World Bank, you know, and we know that banks doesn't make money by just having money in their vault. You have to, they have to loan the money out to be invested in the the so-called uh, deficit or region that can actually generate more money, and most of this money is being encouraged, the government of Nigeria is being encouraged to set up custodians, you know, and most of the custodians are the Western banks like JP Morgan, RBS, Barclays Bank. Uh, even recently, Tony Blair has a bank now that uh, Goodland Judata gave Nigeria uh, the, the Nigerian money with the, with, the, with the IMF for it to be managed. And this is where it becomes very interesting with globalization, right? Because if you start tracing where the money goes, and this is very, it's least research. Uh, when I was looking at this before I went back to uh, to success to do my masters, I was doing this because I wanted to use it to prove that I, I wanted to do my masters. And what I started finding, the pattern I was start finding is that most of the money ends up in places like Wall Street, essentially city of London. And most of the things uh, that they, uh, in 2009, I mean 2007, 2008, when the financial crisis happened, I was following the debate in Nigeria and suddenly Nigerian um, foreign reserve, we lost in three months, we lost about nine billion. And then the justification of which nine billion dollars, dollars, yes, nine billion dollars. The, the, the explanation which solo do was this central government, central bank, uh, of Nigerian pre uh, government, uh, government then was that the amount of money that was going into Nigerians' account was smaller to the form of money that was going out. And that's not true because the Nigerian government did not invest the money in anything, in the public sector. So where, where, what money was going out, what money was coming in? But what, what actually happened was that the money that was given to these banks, the RBS and all those Western banks I mentioned, basically were caught up in the financial crisis in 2007-2008. So when the shock hit, it directly affects Nigerian foreign reserve. You know, and the idea that we have to, like in the West, people have been told that when to achieve, when to act, uh, to way that we can measure your achievement is by having a house and having this money that you don't have, but you can spend, like credit card, like you're paying your mortgages. Even now, everything is being so financialized that you can have a car without even paying the whole car fee. You can pay back on a monthly basis. The question is, when, when people, I only urge people in the West, particularly in Britain, at this, at, uh, in, in, the, in the context of the conversation we're having, is that all this money, it's not like the bank have it in their bank. They must have borrowed this money from somewhere. We should ask ourselves, where did the money come from? Where is all this money that they have been able to invest in the, in, the, in, the, in the mortgages? Because if you want to buy a house, you don't have to put down a down payment. If, you, if you're lucky, you can put down some down payment, but then the other part of it that is being used to pay off your mortgages for you upfront, where does the money come from? You, it basically, your, your standard of living is robbing off somebody else's standard of living in other part of the world. You know, that's globalization. So therefore, if globalization is inducing financially, in terms of how this GDP of these countries are being used to prop, to prop up, uh, prop up uh, Western uh, 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 standard of living, then we should start seeing migration 
as a side effect of that. And if globalization does not have a, a boundary in terms of how finances move across borders, then people should not have restriction in terms of how border moves for across those countries. So also is how uh, your, your daily food from your green, uh, cheap, green, uh, sorry, green pea, you know, we come, some of them come from, uh, from, from Kenya to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to your potatoes that come from region of the Latin America regions, right? All these things is the movement of food it makes by globalization. Even if you're not talking about the finance, let's talk about the transportation itself. Because the, the, the one of the biggest tools of transportation is the technology that make human beings be, be able to move very quick, quickly and the finance that finance those things will be able to move very quickly. The resources that build these facilities to be able to move very quickly comes from mostly Africa. Now you see, Iron Age begin in Africa in 600 BC. We have a religion called Ogun, means the god of iron. So if you worship god of iron, there must be some direct correlation to the understanding of iron in terms of how to extract, process it, and change it into an iron. My grandma worshipped the god of Ogun, right? And I, I, I asked her, why, why, why are you worshipping the god of Ogun? Why not your family, your children have turned to Muslims and Christians? And he said, uh, she was telling me this uh, mythological story, so-called mythological story, that this Ogun was a, was a human. He came to the world and understand, he was able to understand the manipulation of these mineral resources. And when he manipulates this, they, they, that was the greatest revolution that happened to them because then they can use this uh, iron to till the, uh, the soil, to make fa to, to grow things, to improve their hunting skills because you need iron to hunt effectively than using wooden spear and things like that. You need, but then Ogun becomes the Balogun, which is the god of, uh, the god of war because he can then use iron to use to make his swords and arrows and things like that. So all, all the ways of life change drastically. The empire, even their own local kingdoms change as well because you become more efficient using iron. Suddenly, we lost how to make iron. You don't even have to take my word for it. Go to the British Museum, you see all this casting of Af African ancestors' head. You know, how did they do it? And these are not just kind of like rough shape, Casting. These are like definitive features. You can see the definitive t features of all this uh, casting. The question is, how did they do it? And this is where I become to start making my grandma's story very credible, because those people cannot cast the iron from from sand. They must. That is not sand. That is actually not a mud. It is iron. It's whether it is from copper, whether it is from browns, whether browns, whether it's, you name it, is some sort of iron. You know, and I was uh, a professor at the university that gave me a book on Ogun. And then the, the, the woman was actually trying to differentiate between smith and smithing. The, the blacksmith is the final stage of casting. The smith itself is actually the process of separating the impurities from, the, uh, from this thing. Now, Nigeria have a Jokuta, where the steel industry is, and we cannot even make a pin out of it. And this is the starting point of me and my brother, and this is why I was, I'm so depressed and sad about my brother's death. Because he was the first person that told me why Ajakuta did not work. And he learned that from his own university, uh, from his own lecture that says, when Nigeria got independence, the Americans, who was the one financing uh, the so-called self-determination of these uh, African countries, or these developing countries, to basically become independent, d definitively mark out some 14 countries to say these countries will become the superpower of the world that the, and it will become a threat to nigerian uh, sorry to the american uh, national interest and eric kissinger was very clear about that in the 70s in their own in nasaku basically but what, what is interesting was that when nigerian put it when nigerian government put out a a, a, a tender from uh, what they call it, a publication of uh, advertisement for people to uh, to submit a tender for building a Jakuta. The British government was told not to build it. The German government was told not to build it, right? Because these two countries were have busy destroying the, themselves, and the American was the one propping them up through Truman Doctrine and Marshall Plan, right? And then the Russian agreed because they were building the Second World War. There is a there is a there is a now declassified uh, CIA document that actually show how um, uh, the Russian deceived Nigerian government in building a Jakuta, right? And uh, it, the document actually saying. Uh, though they do not agree uh, to Nigeria to build a Jakarta, because I, like I, I told you earlier, you only need three things to become a superpower. 
you need massive form of energy whether it is from oil or uranium yeah or from sunlight and then those energy you need to be able to use it to improve uh, to do to create some energy saving device like i'm basically saying industry building all sort of machine from car to agricultural farms uh, tools to anything and then you use this energy to power it right and the third thing is the uh, nuclear deterrent if you have those three things you are a superpower nigeria has these three things but cannot even do anything with it and this is not this is not accidental it is not it has the potential, obviously, things, not uh, really. It has the potential, but, and the knowledge that no, goes... No nuclear deterrent. Say, for instance, nuclear solar energy. Nigerian has been going about solar energy since the 60s. They knew about it, but they could not build it because the IMF specifically told them you cannot invest in that kind of public fast, uh, product. Because what that will do to the supply of oil is that Nobody is going to need oil to power their house any longer, to pay for your, the gas and the electricity any longer. Because you can then easily just put on a panel on your house and you can generate electricity. That offsets the balance of, of those who make money from um, generators of power from oil, like Shell and things like that. You know, 